failure. Uh, I've spent the last two years going around college campuses uh, talking about failure. Um, I think failure is important. Uh, without failure, there can be no success. Um, our first year students these days are so worried about succeeding, about return on investment, and I know they're spending a lot of money, but they're often afraid to try new things, and that's what an education is about. Uh, little failure is my own testament to a lifetime of failure. Ah, yes. Uh, so the book came out about two years ago, and the critics unanimously agreed uh, that the best thing about the book uh, were the pictures in it, the photographs. <laughs> the text was, uh, you know, I kind of failed at that one um, to keep with the theme. Now, this cover is taken in 1974 in Leningrad, USSR. Uh, and as you can see, uh, they had these photo studios where you could pose your child with the latest in Soviet technology. So, you know, like a, a fork, for example. You had the Beatles, so we had a fork. Uh, and this is an interesting picture. I'm in a car, and most young boys would be very happy to be in a car, but I was mortified. And that's another thing I really failed at, was learning how to drive. Uh, I was 41, two years ago, when I finally learned how to drive a car. Uh, the book is about, also about how I became a writer. And people often ask me, how do you become a writer, uh, especially in, in Brooklyn? Um, first, to be a writer, you have to be asthmatic. Uh, it's very, <laughs> very important. Uh, there's really no way around that one. You have to, you have to fail to breathe first. Um, so uh, growing up in a cold, damp place like Leningrad, uh, which is actually built over a swamp, was perfect. And in 1974, we didn't have what you Americans have, these steroid inhalers, <gasps> you know. Um, so every time I was sick as a child, an ambulance would come and actually take me to the hospital. Uh, and so it's really great for a young writer to be that close to mortality, uh, even when one is two, three years old. Um, when I do these wonderful uh, uh, tours around the country, people often come up to me and have me sign their asthma inhalers. Uh, <laughs> mostly the faculty, but still. Uh. Now, okay, asthma's good, right? The second thing you gotta have is a grandmother who loves to write. And my grandmother, Galia, was a journalist for a paper called Good Evening, Leningrad, uh, which was a much better paper than Good Morning, Leningrad, which was sort of the TMZ of uh, socialist papers. So one day when I was five years old, she said to me, hey, asthma boy, uh, that's what she called me, uh, <laughs> you want to become a novelist? And I said, sure. And already thinking like a writer, I said, how much does it pay? Uh, and she said, I'll give you a piece of cheese for every page you write. And my god, I love that sort of yellow, orange, radioactive Soviet cheese. So now I needed to find a theme to write about. And right outside of our window was a statue of the biggest Lenin in Leningrad. Uh, I'm talking huge. Like, you know, Donald Trump, huge. Um, we called him the Latin Lenin because he was so suave looking. He looked like he was about to rumba. Uh, and we all loved Lenin. And each morning I'd get up and I'd hug Lenin around his pedestal uh, after having my first asthma attack, of course. Uh, I really loved that guy. So my first novel was called Lenin and His Magical Goose. And in it, Lenin meets a goose. Um, and together they invade Finland and try to create a socialist revolution there. Then Lenin and the goose get into a huge political fight. Uh, the goose is Menshevik, and Lenin is, of course, Bolshevik. And then Lenin eats the goose, but not before we learn that Lenin also suffers from asthma. <laughs> now, let's look at this photo. Uh, first of all, notice what I'm wearing. This is the typical five-year-old Soviet boy's outfit. A sailor outfit and tights. So this is 15 years of psychoanalysis right here, pretty much. Right. But what I'm reading is a 400-page book on the, uh, on the War of 1917, the Civil War. And that's how obsessed people were with these kinds of questions nobody cares about anymore. But my grandmother loved Lenin and his magical goose, and she paid me 100 pieces of cheese for a 100-page novel. Here's a fun fact. Even today, Random House pays me mostly in cheese which I sell out of the back of a van in case anyone's interested. Um, and then something crazy happened in 1979. This is a true story, this sounds really strange. So in 1979, the Soviet Union had a bad harvest. Russia always has a bad harvest. Uh, and they desperately needed grain. Uh, America, on the other hand, wanted to import Jews, like myself. So a deal was reached between uh, uh, James Carter, Jimmy Carter, the American president, and Leonid Brezhnev, the Soviet premier, called Grain for Jews 
where millions of tons of Midwestern wheat was exchanged for 50,000 Jews. So I was essentially traded for a baguette and a croissant. So okay, we emigrated to America and I had to leave Lenin behind and I had to learn English and some Hebrew because I was sentenced to eight years of Hebrew school for a crime I did not commit. Um, <laughs> And 1980 was a difficult time to be uh, a Russian in America. Remember all these movies, Ronald Reagan's uh, Evil Empire speech and all those movies, uh, Red Dawn, Red Gerbil, Red Hamster, everything was red. You know, however, I, I even pretended to the kids in Hebrew school that I was actually born in East Berlin, not in Leningrad. You know things are bad when you have to convince Jewish kids that you're actually a German. <laughs> Plus, we were really poor. I had one shirt and one pair of pants and a bunch of t-shirts the parents of the kids in Hebrew school had donated. My toys were a pen and a Chewbacca action figure missing one of its paws. And I had from Russia a fur coat and a fur hat made out of some woodland animal. And the teachers would actually take me aside and say, you know, uh, kids will play with you more if you're furless, uh, which is actually true as an adult as well. Um, <laughs> now, because I was the red gerbil, the second most hated boy in Hebrew school, I thought, what if I wrote a science fiction novel and showed it to the kids in school? Maybe they'll learn to like me. And thank you, Mom, for saving some of my novels. Hundreds of pages of little boy scrawl. This one's called Invasion from Outer Space. Uh, let's take a look at the first chapter. Chapter one, something is wrong. <laughs> Someone, how do you say child services in Russian, right? So let me just, uh, but then it, when I was about 11 years old, a momentous thing happened in the guise of a substitute teacher called Miss S. And this just goes to show you, it's an interesting example of how just one really good educator can turn failure into success. So let me just quickly read you this little section. On one of our first days on the job, Miss S asked us all to bring in our favorite items in the world and to explain why they make us who we are. I bring in my latest toy, a dysfunctional Apollo rocket ship whose capsule pops off with the, with the press of a lever and explain that I have even written my own novel. This passes largely unremarked as the latest batch of Star Wars X-Wing fighters and My Little Ponies are paraded around. Finally, Miss S holds up a sneaker and explains that her favorite activity in the world is jogging. P.U., a boy cries out, holding his nose and pointing at the sneaker. And everyone laughs, except me. Everyone laughs, their wicked child laugh. I am shocked. Here is a young, kind, pretty teacher, and the children are intimating that her feet smell. Only me and my 200-pound Leningrad fur coat are allowed to smell around here. I look to Miss S, so worried that she'll cry, but instead she laughs and then goes on about how running makes her feel good. After we've all finished explaining who we are, Miss S calls me over to her desk. You really wrote a novel, she asks. Yes, I say in my Russian accent. It is called The Challenge. May I read it? Yes, you may read it. I will bring it. And bring it, I do, with the worried admonition, please don't lose Miss S, okay? And then it happens. At the end of the English period, when a book about a mouse who has learned how to fly in an airplane has been thoroughly dissected, Miss S announces, and now Gary will read from his novel. His what? Oh, but it doesn't matter, because I'm standing there holding my, co my composition notebook straight from the Square Deal Notebook people of Dayton, Ohio, zip code 45463. And looking out at me are the boys beneath their little flying saucer yarmulkes, and the girls with their sweet aromatic bangs, their blouses studded with stars. And there's Miss S, who I'm already terribly in love with, but who I recently learned has a fiance, not sure what that means, can't be good, but whose, <laughs> whose bright American face is not just encouraging me, but priding me on. Am I scared? No, I am eager, eager to begin my life. Introduction, I say. The mysterious race. Before the age of dinosaurs, there was human life on Earth. They looked just like men of today, but they were a lot more intelligent than men of today. Slowly, Miss S says to me, read slowly, Gary. Let us enjoy the words. I breathe that in. Miss S wants to enjoy my words. <laughs> so I continue a lot slower. They built all kinds of spaceships and other wonders, but at that time, the Earth circled the moon because the moon was bigger than the Earth. One day, a gigantic comet came and blew the moon up to the size it is today. As I'm reading it, despite the many errors, I'm hearing a different language coming out of my mouth. I do full justice to the many misspellings, the earth circled the moon, and the Russian accent is still thick. But I am speaking in what is more or less comprehensible English. And as I'm speaking along with my strange new English voice, I'm also hearing something entirely foreign to the squealing and shouting that constitutes the background noise of my Hebrew school. Silence. The children are silent. They are listening to my every word. And they will listen to the story for the next five weeks as well, because Miss S will designate the end of every English period as Gary novel time. 
and they will shout out throughout the English period, when will Gabby read already? <laughs> the school is close to Long Island, so yeah. When will Gary read already? And I will sit there in my chair, oblivious to all but Miss Essa's smile, excused from following the discussion of the mouse who learned how to fly in an airplane, so that I may go over the words I will soon read to my adoring audience. And God bless these kids for giving me a chance. May their God bless them, everyone. Thank you.